There were a number of people who were looking forward to the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. If we were able to take a survey of Jewish people living around 3 or 4 BC, I think we would be hard-pressed to find somebody who was unaware of the promises in Holy Scripture of a coming Messiah. Out of the multitudes of people eagerly anticipating the fulfillment of these things, the Lord had chosen to send some angels to a handful of people to say that the time had come. People like Zechariah, a priest who had served the Lord for many years, who was married to a woman named Elizabeth. God sent Gabriel, the angel, to go to Zechariah and tell him that he and his wife would have a son and to name him John, and that this boy, his son, would be the one to prepare the way for the Lord, for the Lord's Messiah. Because he was an old man, Zechariah had a hard time believing Gabriel, and one of the consequences of that was that he lost his ability to speak right up until the time his son was actually born. And when he is able to speak, he bursts out in joyful praise at the thought of Messiah coming into the world. God also sent Gabriel to a young woman named Mary, Gabriel told her that she would be the mother of the Messiah and that it would happen in the most miraculous way. I think we can all agree that what Gabriel said to Mary would be a lot to take in, but she receives the news with humility and she willfully embraces what God has chosen to do through her. Mary just happens to be the relative of Elizabeth who is Zachariah's wife. And so shortly after she receives this news from Gabriel, she goes to Elizabeth for a family visit. What's amazing about that part of the Bible is that the Holy Spirit was upon John the Baptist even when he was in his mother's womb. And when Mary shows up with Jesus in her womb, the Bible tells us that John leaped for joy in his mother's womb. I don't know what that feels like. Maybe some women would know what that feels like. The point is, John was happy. Do you know what Mary does after she hears the news from Elizabeth that John had leaped for joy in her womb? Mary breaks out into a song of joyful praise regarding what God is doing. When the time comes, some nine months later, Mary and her husband travel to Nazareth, sorry, travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and Jesus is born. And when Jesus is born, an angel appears to some shepherds who are watching their sheep near a small town. Now, of course, the shepherds are terrified at the sight of the angel. Who wouldn't be? But the angel says to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And then soon after that, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, many angels appear, and they're praising God for this amazing boy wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. The shepherds go and they tell a bunch of people about what the angel had said and they go and they see Jesus and they, after they see Jesus, they return to their sheep and the Bible says they return to their sheep glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. While the word joy is not specifically used to describe the shepherds there, that is certainly the impression you're given as they're going back to their sheep. They're full of joy, praising God for all that they had seen and heard. We could go on and on, but I think that's enough to see that one of the themes of Christmas, one of the themes of the birth of Jesus is joy. And I believe that joy experienced at that first Christmas is for all who believe throughout all of history. You know when the promise of Jesus coming is first mentioned? It's mentioned all the way back at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 3.15. As Adam and Eve are listening to the consequences of their sin, God makes a promise that there would be one born who would destroy the power of the devil. And the news of Jesus' birth is throughout the whole of the Scriptures. It is for all 
of God's people throughout all of time. We can see a clear example of that in our text this morning, John chapter 8, beginning at verse 48. So I'd encourage you to turn there once again in your Bibles, John chapter 8, verses 48 through 59. At first you may think this seems like a strange text to talk about at Christmas. But what takes place in these verses, and the reason why it may seem strange is because what takes place in these verses happens 33 years after, roughly 33 years after Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And it concerns a man who lived about 2,000 years before Jesus was born. This man was looking forward to Jesus coming. And he was looking forward to Jesus coming in joy. As we are a week away from celebrating Christmas together, I want to turn our attention to the joy of Jesus coming. And I believe in this passage there's some important lessons for us to learn about Christmas joy. The first lesson is worth careful consideration. It's a warning and we would be wise to take it to heart. Here's the first lesson about Christmas joy, is that Christmas joy can be missed. It's possible to have the coming of Jesus to earth right in front of your face, right here, and fail to see it. Christmas joy can be missed. One of the things that you will discover about Jesus when you read the Gospels is that people often get angry with Jesus on somewhat of a regular basis. And when they do, he never backs down from the truth, and, even, and that's true even when it makes people upset. And that's the context of John chapter 8. By the time we make it to verse 48 in the chapter, Jesus has told his listeners that they are slaves, he calls them illegitimate children, and he calls them children of the devil. How many of you think the listeners are happy with Jesus after saying all that? He says all of those things because the people listening to him were resisting the truth of what he had to say. And in the process, they were rejecting him as well. Like most people, they got offended by what Jesus had to say. And here's their response in verse 48. It says, the Jews answered him, those who were listening to him, they answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Most commentators will tell you that Jews considered Samaritans to come from questionable parentage. And so this is a way of them saying to Jesus that you're an illegitimate child and you're also a child of the devil. It's exactly what Jesus had just said to them and they repackage it and they say it back to him. You ever have in the schoolyard where somebody says, I'm rubber, you're glue, and what you say bounces off of me and sticks to you? That's essentially what they do to Jesus. They say the same thing back to him. They don't like what he has to say, and so they don't deal with what he has to say. They just try and hurl an accusation back against him. It's not very original, nor does it do anything to refute what Jesus has said. And yet undeterred, Jesus responds in this way, verses 49 through 51. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, they will never see death. I love how the Lord responds in this situation, and this is so often how Jesus handles situations like this. He doesn't go into a long argument to defend himself. He doesn't make a case for himself. He doesn't act as his own lawyer. He just simply states the truth and then he applies it. He is completely confident in the truth of his obedience to the Father and the Father's commitment to glorify him. And the Father will sort everything out. Jesus is fully trusting in that. The Father constantly shows throughout Jesus' earthly life and ministry that he is God the Son and that the only way to be right with God is through the Son. That's why he says what he does in verse 51. I love how the ESV translates the beginning of this verse. Do you see what it says there? Right at the beginning of verse 51. Look carefully there. It says, truly, truly. That translates the Greek word, amen, from which we get the word amen. And it's a way of saying that something is emphatically true. 
And Jesus says it twice as if, if though to put an extra exclamation point, to put extra emphasis that he, what he is saying is absolutely true. It's as true as it possibly can be. What is so true? What does he say there? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. What is so true is that he is the way, that is, Jesus is the way to eternal life. Brothers and sisters, that is the whole reason Christmas happens. That's why Christmas takes place. Jesus is born into the world so that death can be defeated to the eternal praise of his name. That is a reason to rejoice. That is a reason to have joy. Jesus is saying, if you keep my word, you'll live forever. The joy, that joy, that eternal joy is right in front of their face. I mean, Jesus is right there in front of them. And this is how they respond. Verse 52. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Who died? And the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? You know, they're mostly right in what they say here. Abraham, though he was the father of the nation, he died. The prophets, for all of their faithfulness and for all of their obedience and for all of the miracles that were performed through the prophets throughout the ages, all of them died except for Elijah. That would mean that in order for what Jesus is saying here to be right about giving people eternal life, that would mean he would have to be greater than Abraham. That would mean that he would have to be greater than the prophets. And that is totally beyond what his listeners can accept. As they look at Jesus, they're looking at him right in the face. They're probably just a few feet away from them. They're talking to him. As they see him, they can only see his humanity. And they don't like the insights that he's offered about who they are just a few minutes before. And so they take offense at him rather than rejoice. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is standing right in front of them, but they can't see it. They miss it. You know, that happened on the first Christmas too, didn't it? The most important person ever to be born in the history of the world spent his first night in a feeding trough for animals. That's where Jesus spent his first night. With the exception of a handful of shepherds and some people that they told about it, people would have looked at the birth of Jesus and they would have seen an ordinary baby born to ordinary people. For most people... That first Christmas was just another ordinary night in Bethlehem. Most people missed the joy of Christmas on that first Christmas. And the sad truth of it is, the same thing is still happening today. God has left absolutely no doubt about who Jesus is. And yet most people go through Christmas season without giving him much of a thought, if any thought at all. People put up trees, They buy gifts, they prepare meals, and they pay no attention to Christ. Many people in our day get offended at the very phrase, Merry Christmas. I heard recently about a movement where people want to ban Christmas as a holiday in Canada. Many people will sit in church pews for the only time this year at Christmas. They'll sing some songs, they'll hear hear some Bible readings, They may tolerate some guy talking to them for a few minutes and then they'll get on with whatever they want to do. Many people will come face to face with Jesus this Christmas and they will miss seeing him. And if you miss seeing him, and I mean truly seeing him, then you will miss the joy of Christmas. 
There is no gift that you will find under the tree on Christmas morning that will give you joy. I mean true joy that will last. You just think for a minute. What did you get for Christmas last year? Most of us probably don't even remember. Don't even know. We were happy for a few minutes and then it goes on a shelf or it's used to hang up laundry or whatever. That happens with exercise equipment all the time. (laughs) It doesn't last, right? And if you've celebrated more than a few Christmases in your life, you know that's true. You know that the things that you find under your tree don't give you lasting joy. All of that stuff eventually lets you down. The joy of Christmas is something altogether different. That's what we see in the next couple of verses here. We see this second lesson about Christmas joy, and and that is that God's glory displayed in Christ is the joy of Christmas. From the appearance of angels to the working of miracles, the Lord has put his clear stamp of approval on the life and ministry of Jesus. God's glory displayed in Christ is the joy of Christmas. While their attitude is not a good one, that is the listeners to Jesus in this passage don't have a good attitude, and they don't really want to hear the true answer to their question that they ask at the end of verse 53. They do ask a really good question at the end of verse 53. Look there at the end of the verse. You see what they ask? They say, who do you make yourself out to be? Now, it's likely asked with the attitude. This is probably how they intend it, is who do you think you are? You think you're greater than Abraham? You think you're greater than the prophets? In other words, their intent behind the question is, Jesus, you are making yourself out to be something that you're not. This is how the Lord responds in verses 54 and 55. He says this, Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known Him. I know Him. If I were to say that I do not know Him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know Him, and I keep His word. Jesus here is speaking in His humanity. And in His humanity, He doesn't make Himself out to be anything. In other words, he does not do anything or try to do anything to make himself appear more than he is. It's quite the opposite, in fact, with Jesus. What we find in the life and ministry of Jesus is we see the purest form of humility that is possible for a human being. We never see Jesus in the Gospels making a show of himself. We never see him putting on fancy clothes or making productions to try and make himself appear bigger than he is. There is no fakery or deceit. There is no taking advantage of people in his life. What does he do instead? What does Jesus do instead while he's upon the earth? He serves people. He associates with the poor and the lowly and the outcast. He holds no formal position of power in society or government. And his point here is to say, when he talks about him not glorifying himself, his point is to say that he has done nothing in worldly terms to make himself into something. Rather, it is God the Father who has done all sorts of things to call attention to who Jesus truly is. It was the Father who sent angels to announce Jesus' birth. It was the Father who moved in the heart of the Emperor of Rome to affect the whole of the Roman Empire or the known world at the time so that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Why? To fulfill what God had said through the prophet Micah. It was the Father who moved in the hearts of kings from the east to have them come and worship this baby boy and bring him gifts. It was the Father who spoke from heaven at Jesus' baptism and said, This is my Son whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. Jesus never makes Himself more than He is. But it's also true... While he's never trying to make himself more than he is, it's also true that he can never make himself less than he is. He can never deny who he is. He cannot deny his relationship with the Father, and he cannot deny his faithfulness to all that the Father has asked him to do. 
And that is the joy of Christmas. The joy is that one has been born into the world in whom God the Father fully delights and is happy to glorify. That is the very ground upon which Jesus is able to save us, is that he has perfectly obeyed God and God delights in glorifying him. That's how we can be saved. Is Jesus greater than Abraham and the prophets? Yes, he is. And he points out here that Abraham knew it. Look at verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Some commentators think Abraham saw in Genesis 17 the promise of the coming Messiah when God had promised Abraham that many descendants would come through him and that kings would come through Abraham. And they they see in that the, the promise of a Messiah, a king who would come to save his people. Whether Jesus is referring to a passage in Scripture or he's referring to something else, I think he's probably referring to something else. It's clear that Abraham, Jesus is thinking that Abraham had some understanding of what God would do for him. That, that God would send a Savior into the world for Abraham. And Abraham looked forward to that day and he rejoiced. He understood that someone would be born according to the power of God for the glory of God to save God's people and it made him happy. If you read Abraham's story, you'll find that there's a few ups and downs along the way, but you will also find a man who believed God. He came to trust God so much in his life that he was willing to fully trust the life of his only son through his wife, Sarah. I'm convinced that he was able to do that. He was able to entrust Isaac to God because he believed that God had the power to raise the dead. I'm convinced that's why Abraham buys a little chunk of land in the promised land. Did you know that? Abraham never owned any of the promised land. He only ever owned a small little strip. Do you know what he used that small little strip of land for? A graveyard. A burial place. Why? Why Why would Abraham buy a small plot of land in Canaan so that he and his family could be buried there? I think it's because he believed that God would raise him from the dead. I think it's because he believed that when God said he was going to give him the land, he really meant it. He was going to give Abraham the land. And when Abraham was raised from the dead, he would enjoy the fulfillment of all God's promises. He saw, as he was looking ahead in the future, he saw that God would fulfill his promises and he rejoiced. That's the joy of Christmas. Abraham was looking forward to that. Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, the kings from the east and some others, they had that joy when Jesus was born. They were able to experience it when he was born. The disciples, Jesus' disciples, nearly 500 of them, experienced that joy when Jesus appeared to them after being raised from the dead. We have that joy as we look back on those things by faith and as we look forward to our Savior who lives and reigns forever coming again to make all things new. All of that is tied to Christmas. Christmas is so much more than a baby being born. Jesus is so much more than an ordinary guy who lived a long time ago who did some memorable things. This is the glory of God being displayed to the fullest measure in the Son that He loves. And because He does that, we can have the hope of eternal life. There is no greater offer of joy than that. And that is what Christmas is all about. That brings us to one more important lesson from this text. It's already been hinted at, but it comes to the forefront here in the next few verses. It's good to hear the warning that Christmas joy can be missed. People were right, Jesus was right in front of their face and they missed it. You can miss it too. 
It's good to hear that warning. It's good to know that the joy of Christmas is the glory of God displayed in Christ. That's good to know. But we also need to know this third lesson is that Christmas joy is possible because God does the impossible. The story of Jesus goes back much farther than his birth in Bethlehem. It goes all the way back to all eternity past. Christmas joy is possible because God does the impossible. The people upset with Jesus aren't thinking to, my, aren't thinking to themselves when he talks about Abraham, when Jesus talks about Abraham rejoicing at his day. They aren't thinking in their minds, oh, he must be talking about Genesis 17. That's not what they're thinking about. They hear what Jesus has to say about Abraham, and then they respond this way in verse 57. So the Jews said to him, You are not 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? See, for them, the math doesn't work. Abraham, everybody knew that Abraham had lived somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 years before Jesus was even born. How could Jesus, being so young, he's around 33 at this point, how could Jesus, being so young, have possibly seen and talked with Abraham? Because that's how it sounds. It sounds like he was there. It sounds like he witnessed Abraham rejoicing. How is that possible? That's a fair question. I doubt they're wanting to know the real answer here, but it's a good question. If I had said to you this morning that I had personally talked with Canada's Prime Minister, first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, you would rightly question my sanity. Because John A. Macdonald died in 1891, and I was born in 1979. So the math doesn't work there, right? So how could Jesus say what he's saying? Now, Jesus could have pointed to passages like Genesis 15 or Genesis 17. He could have pointed to passages in the Bible to say, hey, look, this is what Abraham was rejoicing in. He could have made a biblical argument here. That's not what he does. Listen to what he does. Listen to what he says in verse 58. This is amazing. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Again, just like in verse 51, he gives the emphatic, truly, truly. Like this cannot be more true, Jesus says at the beginning of the verse. Now when he says that, when he says those words, truly, truly, that leaves us with only three options regarding what he says next. One, he's a bold-faced liar. And if Jesus is a liar, then you can't trust anything that he says. That's one option. Second option is he's totally insane. He's, the cheese has slipped off the cracker. <laughs> he's lost his mind. The third option is he's telling the truth. Those are the only three options that we're left with when Jesus says so emphatically, truly, truly, I say to you, his answer here is claiming something more than he existed before Abraham. He could have said, he could have said, before Abraham was, I was. Instead, he chooses to say, before Abraham was, I am. That is exactly how the Lord Almighty introduces himself to Moses at the burning bush. You remember that? Moses, he's tending to some sheep. He sees this bush on fire that's not burning. He goes over to check it out, and God Almighty speaks to him, and he introduces himself as, I am who I am. If you go back into the Greek translation of that passage in the Old Testament, you will find the exact same Greek words in that text that Jesus uses here. God intends a whole bunch of good theology to be conveyed about himself in his name, I am, or the God who is. He communicates in his name, in that phrase, I am, he communicates his eternal nature, that he has always existed for all eternity past. There is never a time when God has not existed, and he will always exist for all eternity future. He is always the God who is. 
He tells us about in that name, I am. He tells us about his aseity. Aseity is a fancy theological word that means that God exists in and of himself, that he needs nothing outside of himself to exist. He depends on nothing to be who he is. His name is telling us about his immutability. That's a fancy word that means he does not change. God always remains the same. His greatness, his glory neither increases or decreases over time. His character, his knowledge, his attributes are all constant and they are consistent forever. These are at least some of the things that we can glean from the phrase, I am. And they are things that are only true about God. You can only claim to be self-existent if you have always existed. You can only claim to be unchanging if you depend on nothing outside of yourself to exist. Only God can claim these things. Jesus knows that. Jesus knows that. This is no slip of the tongue or misunderstanding that Jesus has in this moment. He knows fully well what he's saying. And he's claiming to possess the fullness of what it means to be God in himself. Before Abraham was, I am. His listeners get it. They understand. Look at verse 59. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, if Jesus is insane or he's a liar, what they do is right. They're they're not picking up their stones for fun here. They're picking up the stones to throw at Jesus to put him to death. That's what was commanded in the law, Leviticus 24, verse 16. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. The entire assembly must stone him. Now, a mere human being claiming to be God is total blasphemy because you're making God less than he is. That's what blasphemy is, is when you misrepresent who God is. And if a mere human being who's only a human being says what Jesus says here, they deserve to be stoned to death because they're making God less than he is. On the other hand, if what Jesus says here is true, then something happened When Jesus is conceived in Mary's womb by the power of God, something happened that is completely beyond our understanding. Something happened that seems completely impossible to us. It would mean, if what Jesus says here is true, it would mean that God by his power was able to join the full divinity of God the Son with true humanity in one person. It would mean that infinity had been joined to finiteness without either quality interfering with the other. This, I believe, is the greatest mystery of the Christian faith. This is the greatest work that God has ever performed. It's greater than creation. It's greater than parting the sea. It's greater than feeding the 5,000. This is the greatest miracle that God ever performed. And it's the reason why Christmas joy is possible. Because if this didn't happen, then we can't be saved. You see, the blood of sheep and goats can't do anything for you. They can't, a a sheep or a goat can't stand in your place. Only somebody who's a true human being can stand in your place because that's who you are. You're genuinely human. But if our Savior were only human, he would not have the capacity to pay the debt of every sinner who believes upon his name. It is only because he is infinitely worthy that he can save us all. Now notice here that no stoning takes place. Why is that? Look at what it says. They picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why doesn't the stoning happen here? It's not because Jesus is really good at dodging things. It's not because he can run really fast or he's excellent at hide and seek. It's not why 
the stoning doesn't take place. It happens because of his sovereign power over all of life. It's not the only time people tried to kill Jesus and he walked through the crowd. Besides being powerful, he's also gracious. The Lord could have put all of these people to death with a thought. And he would have been right to do so because their wanting to stone him means that they were guilty of the very blasphemy that they were accusing him of. Because they were refusing to recognize who he truly is. He could have killed them with a thought. Instead, he exercises his power to simply walk away. This happens on a number of occasions. Not only that, but he also, Jesus in his life, he also commands the wind of the waves. He walks on the water. He does the miracle of creation. He heals the sick. He casts out demons. He raises the dead. And most importantly, he himself was raised from the dead after willingly surrendering his life so that he would die in our place. No ordinary man can do those things. And yet he also got hungry. He needed to sleep. And yes, he did die, really die on the cross in his humanity. And God doesn't do any of those things. God doesn't sleep. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get hungry. And he doesn't die. So here is the mystery and the joy of Christmas. Almighty God joined with humanity in Mary's womb and was born into the world in Bethlehem. God does what seems impossible, and that is why Christmas joy is possible. And the only question that remains is, do you have it? Do you have true Christmas joy in your life? Because the fact of it is, it can be missed. It's been staring you right in the face this morning. It will probably be staring you right in the face all the way up until next week. And you could miss it. If you don't see the glory of God in Christ, you will miss it. If you refuse to accept that God can do what seems impossible to you for your eternal good, then you will miss it. Don't miss it. Because Christmas joy is real. And Christmas joy is true joy that lasts much longer than a day or a few weeks. It lasts forever because it is the work of our unchanging, all-powerful, all-glorious God. Let's pray together. Lord, how amazing it is that Abraham who lived 2,000 years before Jesus came into the world, looked ahead and saw Christ coming and rejoiced. How amazing is it, Lord, that you sent angels into the world to people like shepherds and Mary and Joseph and the kings from the east so that they could see Christ coming into the world and rejoice. How amazing it is, Lord, that you have preserved these things in your word so that we can know about them, so that we can believe them by faith and we can also rejoice at Christ coming into the world. That's incredible. Thank you and praise you, God, for Christmas joy. And I pray that everyone within the sound of my voice would truly know it. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thee.